Hello and welcome to Edison TV. We are joined today by Peter Bjorn Johnson and Klaus Riesenberg from Chosa Oncology. Chosa is a European biotechnology company, and today we are going to discuss the company's drug response predictor, or the DRP. Welcome, Peter and Klaus. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So to kick things off, could you explain how the DRP technology helps stratify patients who are more likely to respond to platinum chemotherapy and how this can be relevant for treatment decisions? Yes, thank you, Aaron. So, so what we are now is that we, we have, I would say, as we have actually now a solution to one of the largest inefficiencies in modern cancer treatment. We have a platinum chemotherapy response predictor, and platinum uh, is used now today in more than 16 different cancers, the largest cancers, uh, types of cancers, and use has never been higher than, than today. You can say for many patients, platinum is definitely the best of all options, but uh, the problem is that it does not always work. So typically we see uh, in, in lung cancer treatment, for instance, it's great in, in 40% of the patients, whereas 30% have absolutely no benefit. And then there is a 30% in a, you could say, in a gray zone with no or very limited gain uh, by platinum. And so generally it, it's the best drug and therefore everybody gets it. But there are other drugs uh, that these particular patients might gain much more from. Uh, and now with our technology, we can see who benefits. And a large fraction of patients uh, could actually now be, be treated with a more effective therapies by this, uh, this prediction. So we could say we can, we can differentiate who is going to respond. So the, in a way, it's very similar to so old days with, where you have a test to see whether the, the penicillin will work or not. And if it doesn't work, you have to give something else. Penicillin is a great drug and is used for many, many infections. Platinum is a great drug used for many, many cancers. Now we have a system where we, where we can uh, predict. And uh, we have our, you could say, we have our, our recent results from, uh, from uh, a study that was done by the European Theoretic Oncology Group. Uh, and here we have, uh, here we can really see, you can see in the slide how we, how we are able to predict the, uh, the benefit of, of uh, the individual patients. So basically we, we have a test that can separate uh, with the 50%, uh, the, the, the ones that are in the top 50 and the ones that are in the bottom 50, there is a, there's a more, there's almost 12 months of overall survival. This is a study done on, on, you could say advanced lung cancer. And we can also see it's really, uh, how it's a terrible disease. The, the overall survival, uh, for the average patient, the median overall survival is, is eight months. Uh, uh, but we can separate that into the ones that benefit from platinum. They basically get a, a 16 month survival, whereas the ones that don't benefit, are down at a 5.5.6. So there is a clear opportunity to separate those that benefit and those that do not. It's not a complex text uh, or test. We basically we need uh, we need a slice of 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 the biopsy from from the patient's tumor. So so they, every time you diagnose cancer, you need to have a sample of the tumor and you have to give to have it to the pathologist. And so there's always a biopsy uh, available. We need a tiny slice of that bi uh, biopsy, and then we, we test it for, for the drug response prediction likelihood. It's a 205 gene, so it sounds like very complex, but in essence, it's now something you just measure, and you come up with a, an answer within a couple of days. Fantastic. So you've touched upon it a little bit just there, but I wonder if you could explain a bit more what kind of data and in which forms of cancer has chosen to demonstrate that the DRP scores correlates with differences in cancer treatment outcomes. Yeah, so we, we have data in, in both in lung cancer patients and in breast cancer. That's where we've demonstrated. We have four, four validations in lung cancer now with the 
with a recent uh, study with the European Th Thoracic Oncology Group, we now have four studies in lung cancer demonstrating uh, our ability to predict, and we have two, two studies in, in breast cancer. In breast cancer, it's been in uh, the metastatic setting. That's where the, where the tumors have spread. In lung cancer, it's also in the very early, what we call the adjuvant, where you basically add platinum after surgery. Uh, so it's it's sort of a broad spectrum of cancers and and also how the, how it's how it's useful. So given that immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors have been leading improvements in cancer outcomes, what role do platinum drugs still play in cancer treatments, and how can the DRP be used in guiding combination treatment approaches? So so I'll take this also, Klaus. Yeah. So they, so they basically. Immune therapy has also revolutionized the treatment of both breast and lung and other cancers. And the, the, the real sort of real synergy is now where we see where platinum and immune therapy work fantastic together. So, so the more than half of immune therapies used uh, are actually mm -hmm. used in, in combinations where platinum and the immune therapy is done upfront or later, but together they have this synergy. So they have to be given together. And that's, of course, a very important uh, a very important point for us to see that we're now able to predict on the platinum part of this uh, synergy. There are data now showing that those two product types, the immune therapy and the, and the platinum, have equal value in, in, therapeutic, in therapeutic gain. And we now can, you can say, really differentiate who benefits from platinum or who should have something else with the immune therapy, but not platinum. And that gives us a very nice differentiator. So given the looming patent expiries for blockbuster checkpoints, k Truder and Opdivo, for example, and the increasing competition in immunotherapy, do you see an opportunity at all to potentially partner the DRP with an immunotherapy developer to uh, differentiate the offering? Yes, Aaron, uh, thanks for, for this uh, question. Yes, we definitely see a, a, a significant opportunity for partnering with some of the level two or level three uh, checkpoint inhibitors. It's the fact that, that Ketruda, Opdivo, and a couple of other uh, drugs, they take up uh, more than 85% of the total market. And then we have like 20 plus other products that have similar, similar mechanism of action but they simply do not have the same marketing power or they have come late into the party, so to say. And for those, we would be a, a, a clear uh, partner uh, for those to, to, to kind of differentiate in the market and, and bring on uh, improved efficiencies also compared to the Kutudas and, uh, and the Opdivos of, of, of the cancer world. So that's definitely uh, one of the, the roads for commercialization that we are considering. So following on from that, could we elaborate a bit more on what the regulatory and commercial strategy could be for bringing the DRP to markets and also touch upon how big the opportunity could be in your view? Yes. Uh, with the latest uh, validations, uh, external validations that we, we got from this ETOP study that we uh, communicated to the market uh, in September and had a few follow-up, uh, publications in uh, uh, press releases in October. Uh, we believe that we are ready to start the commercialization uh, and, and we have different uh, pathways that we are, are looking into. So we could uh, work as a standalone uh, genomic test by, uh, conducted by ourselves or in collaboration with some of the large uh, diagnostic companies. It's a market where more than two and a half million tests are being performed uh, annually and actually uh, more than 50% of, of these tests are actually being performed in, uh, in, in, the, in the lung and in the breast uh, cancer uh, segment. And they represent uh, a total of 9 billion uh, US uh, dollars. So that's a quite interesting market to get into. Uh, we also see this, as we just mentioned before, the, that we could partner with one of these drug owners. Uh, uh, it could also be uh, a biosimilar uh, owner. We use uh, Kitruda. They are running out of patent here in 28. And, and uh, then we would be playing a different 
we would be kind of uh, uh, differentiating or, or be a leverage for differentiation in, in a plus 100 billion uh, US dollar uh, market um, that are, uh, well, globally also, and, and isn't this uh, uh, combination treatment of platinum and uh, immune therapy. So, so we see two different uh, roads uh, to commercialization, and they are not kind of uh, mutually exhaustive. They can run parallel. So, so we see some, some very attractive commercial opportunities laying ahead of us. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Moving on now, given the most recently completed quarter, what are the near-term cash expenditure trends expected and how long is the company's current operating runway? So, so, so right now we have, uh, uh, um, I would say, a modest uh, burn uh, of uh, approximately... Uh, half a million DKK per month. So that is equivalent to, to 80,000 pounds or 80,000 euros uh, per month. And when we did uh, our latest uh, capital increase, that was a directed issue uh, and a rights issue in, in, in June, we, we were cautious not to raise more than, than what was needed to get into Q2 of 26 because we, we, we had... We had large or high expectations for the, the data readout that we have then published here in September and October. So, so this is uh, what we are looking at. And, and we have conducted uh, three directed issues since our start. And that's what have uh, paved the way for our, our current success. Excellent. So before we wrap up today, could you summarize some of the key milestones and catalysts for Chosa that we should expect across the next 12 months? So uh, we have this uh, this collaboration with the uh, European Thoracic Oncology Partners, and and we we ha have uh, we are submitting together with them. We are submitting a, an abstract in 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 January, and the the you could say publication of the full the full result of the, the slide you saw before the the, the publication of this is going to be in 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 April. This is, of course, going to nourish our, you could say, discussions with commercial partnerships and, and pharma companies. So that's uh, one very important step in, in April. We uh, are also doing uh, studies directly with, uh, with hospitals. We come up with a, a readout in June where we have a study done with immune therapy and platinum that uh, we expect is going to validate our, our data right now. So that's in June. And... I think as the and, third, and then and then as the the third point that we would like to express here is that that with with the the, the data that we will know we will publish in 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 April uh, and with uh, the upcoming combination treatment readout, then we believe that that we will have uh, multiple commercial dialogues and that uh, are expected to lead to a commercial uh, partnership uh, during the second half of uh, twenty six. Excellent. Well, thank you both for a very insightful discussion, and we're looking forward to following Chosa's progress. If our audience would like to learn more, please refer to the Chosa website or edisongroup.com, where our research is really accessible. Peter and Klaus, thanks again for your time today.